hi, Dr. Mapstone. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm going to just do a little introduction. Dr. Mark Mapstone is a professor of neurology at the <clears throat> University of California Irvine School of Medicine. He is a member of the UCI Institute for Memory Impairments and Neurological Disorders and fellow of the UCI Center for Neuro Neurobiology of Learning and Memory. His research focuses on preclinical detection of neurological disease using cognitive tests and biomarkers obtained from blood, and he has a special interest in developing strategies to maintain successful cognitive aging. Dr. Mapstone earned his PhD, PhD in clinical psychology at Northwestern University and completed fellowship training in neuropsychology and experimental therapeutics at the University of Rochester. And he is here today to talk to us about cognition and mood. And I'm gonna... All right. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and see if I can get my slides up for you all to see. Or I can, I got that. Does it work? Is that working? Do you guys, does everybody see it? What do we think? Is it working? That's not the right one. <laughs> <laughs> I can't give that talk. The way it goes. Here we go. Okay. Good. Yes. Okay. So you can see slides, I hope. Um, Mel, I'll allow you to uh, correct me if I'm wrong in assuming here that the slides are advancing. Yes, I will. I will do it. Okay, great. Everyone says we're on track, so I will advance the slides. Okay, so why don't we why don't we start with the first slide, which are um, my disclosures. So before I give a, a, a professional talk, I, I'd like to let you know where uh, my uh, research support comes from. Um, and this is primarily for uh, you to decide as a viewer uh, what my conflicts of interest may be. I don't believe there are any in this talk, but I'm gonna give you my, uh, my funding sources. Uh, as you can see here, I have uh, a, a number of grants, primarily through the National Institutes of Health. Um, and this is to do my work in Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. Um, I also have, um, I, I receive uh, small payments from foundations to do lectures like this to cover my time. Um, I'm a consultant for a company that's doing uh, some work, uh, gene therapy in Parkinson's disease. And I also have some uh, patents that are related to my work in biomarkers in neurodegenerative disease. Again, none of the information, I, I believe none of the information I'm going to tell you about today is going to um, be affected by these uh, sources of funding. Okay, next slide, please. Are we set? Is that working? I'm hoping. Okay, so um, here I want to start off with a little bit of a discussion, um, and, and some of this is going to be brought out in later talks um, in the day today, but um, in the beginning, uh, the, 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 the disorder of Parkinson's disease was described by James Parkinson um, in a monograph that he published in 1817 called The Essay on the Shaking Palsy. Um, and this is a, um, a, a, a seminal piece of work in which he describes from a very qualitative point of view, um, some of the people that he observed in his practices and also people just walking around the streets of London. Um, as you can see from this illustration here, um, the, he's got a drawing of the classic stooped posture of an individual with Parkinson's disease. And of course, people had Parkinson's or, or the symptoms of this disease long before uh, James Parkinson came on board. But he was really the first person to, to try to understand, understand and describe the different features of this disease. Of course, the thing that's most obvious and outward in the disease is the motor features and the physical symptoms. And so most of his essay on the shaking palsy describes several vignettes of the motor features of the disease. And we all know these as the classic uh, triad of tremor, rigidity, bradykinesia, and the fourth of gait and balance problems. So this is the, the, the initial description of the disease, which was very, very much focused on the motor symptoms of the disease, because this is the thing that's most uh, commonly seen. Now, it wasn't until a little bit later in the mid-1860s 
that Trousseau, a, a French neurologist, uh, describes some of the early cognitive issues. And this is a, really the first appreciation that this motor disease, what people thought was primarily a motor disease, had some other um, issues as well. And Tr Trousseau described it um, as the intellect gets weakened at last, the patient loses his memory, and his friends notice soon that his mind is not as clear, pernicious caudacity sets in. Uh, caudacity, sorry, uh, sets in. And so what that means is that he's starting to appreciate that the um, motor symptoms are not the only thing that's going on here and that there are some cognitive issues as well. I had to look up the word caudicity as well. Um, that, that actually means senility. Um, I don't use the term. I don't think it's been used in a while, but that's what that means. So in any event, um, the, although this is known as primarily a motor disorder, uh, there are also other features as well that we need to be uh, appreciative of. Next slide, please. And so the the um, recognition of non-motor features has become a major importance in the past uh, decades. And these uh, features will be talked about in greater detail by Dr. Katz later. Um, but I wanna point out that in the left here, you see this pie graph with the um, different aspects of Parkinson's disease. And the one that we tend to focus most on is the motor features there in the, the, the separated piece of pie. But there are other features as well, including cognitive, neuropsychiatric, sleep, we heard about sleep this morning uh, from Connie and Davis, and then the autonomic features as well. Um, I, again, I'm not gonna go through these, but you can see that the presence of these non-motor features are really quite high. So most um, or many individuals with Parkinson's disease may experience one or more of these non-motor features. Okay, next slide, please. I wanna go um, talk a little bit now about the uh, cognitive and affective or depression and anxiety features. Um, but in order to do that, I wanna to try to explain a little bit about why these features might be present and why there's such a diversity of different things going on in Parkinson's disease. So you've got motor things, the way that you move. Parkinson's disease affects the way that you think. It can affect the way that you feel um, and behave. And so to understand why those things might happen, um, you've got to learn a little bit about the basic neurobiology of how uh, the brain works. So neurons are those cells um, in your brain that are the workhorses. They do most of the heavy lifting in the brain to, to, to generate what our brains can do. They communicate using electrical signals and chemicals, including the chemical dopamine. So most of you, I think, have heard of dopamine because it's the major a uh, neurotransmitter that's being targeted in the treatment of the disease. But the important thing to know here is that dopamine is critical for these neurons to talk to each other. Uh, next slide, please. Neurons are connected to each other in large networks. Um, so they all talk to each other in different ways and they operate in different parts of the brain. So the whole brain isn't doing everything all at once. Different pieces come on board when different things need to be done. Next slide, please. Each of those networks or different parts of the brain contributes a special thing to the function of the brain. So the things that we do, for example, memory would require one or two of these different areas that you see here in front of you, um, but not all of them. And so different parts of the brain are responsible for working together cohesively to produce the behaviors that we understand as the things that we can do. Uh, next slide, please. So what causes non-motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease? Well, the idea is that all of these different brain regions are sort of connected to each other in a very global way through these chemicals that I've talked about. You can see in the top leftmost uh, brain slice, the output of the dopaminergic system. So this is the chemical dopamine that's strongly implicated in Parkinson's disease. And the little purple arrows are where the uh, dopamine transmitters are projecting out into the brain. The next surface of the brain is the transmitter system for acetylcholine. And you can see that it overlaps pretty substantially with those projections that were in, in the dopamine system. And then finally, the serotonin system. Um, and you can see, again, all of these areas are being connected by these three different neurotransmitters. So although dopamine is very important, these other two are also very important as well. The important thing is that 
dopamine is primarily implicated as the neurotransmitter. And you can see in the bottom slides, on the leftmost, um, a, a brain section of the uh, basal ganglia in a patient with Parkinson's disease. And then somebody right next to that that, had, that does not have Parkinson's disease. And you can see the two red dots in the person without Parkinson's disease indicates that that area of the brain is producing lots of dopamine, what we would say the typical or normal amounts of dopamine. If you look to the left, you can see that the, the patient with Parkinson's disease has much less dopamine, much less red there in those areas, indicating that that individual is having trouble producing dopamine. Now, if we take it back to what I just said before, dopamine is critical for producing all of these brain functions like memory and thinking and feeling and moving. And so when you have a loss of this dopamine, you're going to have problems with those behaviors. Okay, next slide, please. I want to introduce now an important concept um, that's called the premotor phase of Parkinson's disease. And this is before motor symptoms become clinically manifest, which means that before you even see that first tremor or have that first difficulty um, walking, there are some symptoms that might be present in this premotor phase, meaning before the motor symptoms. And as you can see, most of these symptoms uh, are characterized by things like loss of the sense of smell, REM behavior disorder, which is acting out in your sleep, excessive sleepiness, uh, mood disorders, and constipation changes in your bowel function. These things, these non-motor features, can precede the, pre, the, the motor features by many years. And so it's really important to know that, that these things are, are present, but it also underscores the importance of these non-motor features, that these things are really important, they're, they're an integral part of the disease process, and we really need to look, be learning a lot more about these particular features and how we can address them because they have a significant impact on quality of life. Uh, next slide, please. So the, these, as I said, the, the non-motor features can be highly impactful on the way that you live your life and, and the quality that you get out of your life. They're very common. They affect the majority of patients in one or more of them. They're typically less predominant early in the disease, but as the disease progresses, they tend to get more predominant. They can impact your quality of life. They can impact your relationships and finances. They're an important source of caregiver, care partner burden. Um, these are the things that, that cause great difficulty for care partners to, to manage. And these are the things that cause, particularly cognitive issues, cause the greatest um, need for assisted living and assistance in uh, activities of daily living. So these are things that are really, really very important and, and impact your quality of life and much more than your ability to move around or not move around. They impact your ability to do the other things that your brain does on a daily basis. Next slide, please. Okay, now I'm gonna move into some more uh, details of the mood aspects or how your, your brain allows you to feel things. Um, depression is a feeling of sadness or, um, uh, or, or low mood lasting at least two weeks and is characterized by changes in sleep or appetite. Uh, decreases in cognitive abilities like concentration and attention, feeling slowed down, or sometimes the opposite, feeling very restless and agitated. Uh, there are also feelings of self-worth, low self-worth or uh, guilty, uh, feeling guilty. And sometimes, but not all the time, feelings of thoughts of death or suicide uh, may be present. These particular symptoms, the dep depression in, 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 in uh, particular, uh, are more predictive of distress in the patient than in the actual motor disability. That is to say that very severe depression can be present in the absence of really severe motor disability. So you can have mild motor symptoms, but have a very uh, strong depression. It's also more frequent in men, um, and particularly those men that have a family history of this. Uh, next slide, please. The causes of depression in Parkinson's disease um, are multifactorial, meaning they can cause, it can arise from many different causes. Um, and any particular individual may have one or more of these different causes. For some, it's the aspect of, of psychological coping with having a chronic disease like Parkinson's disease. It might be related to the isolation or early retirement or restriction of activities that comes along with having motor disability. 
The underlying basis may also be biological primarily. And for most people, um, as we've learned already, the, with the dopaminergic system, the cholinergic and the serotonergic system, there's, a, there's typically a biological basis for depressed mood in Parkinson's disease. Um, and these are, again, due to those three or more. There are other neurotransmitters, but dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. Now, there are some challenges to recognizing depression in Parkinson's disease. Um, and the, the first is that some people just don't report it. Um, they think that this is part of getting old, they feel down, and they just don't tell people about it. So that's why it's really important to be open and, and communicative with your care partners and your doctors. Um, some people have difficulty recognizing their moods um, and have trouble interpreting their own internal mood states, and they don't know when they uh, are, are feeling depressed and they don't know how to express that verbally. Also, it's hard to distinguish sometimes symptoms of depression from the motor disability. That is to say, if you have difficulty making uh, facial expressions, as we saw with Connie and Davis, um, and they like to make their faces into weird positions to, to just activate those muscles. Um, if it's difficult to do that, you may look depressed because you can't do that very well, but you may not be depressed. And so it's, sometimes it's hard to pull out whether someone is truly depressed or not. Again, the reason for that is that, as you'll see through the rest of my talk, there's a very strong overlap between the motor symptoms, the cognitive symptoms, and the mood symptoms because they rely on the same underlying neurochemicals in same brain regions. And so that's why there's overlap there. Next slide, please. I'm gonna talk now about anxiety. Anxiety is a feeling of tension or worry or being wound up or anxious. Um, this is something that's sometimes hard to put into words. It can be accompanied by decreases in concentration and thinking, uh, feeling overwhelmed, uh, irritability. Again, we're coming back to sleep. Uh, Davis and Connie talked about sleep this morning. Um, poor sleep may be a symptom of anxiety. Um, this can come in multiple different forms. It can be a very generalized anxiety, meaning you're just always worked up and there's no specific cause. It can be specific anxiety attacks in which you have um, a, a response uh, in, during a particular event or panic attacks. It can be manifest as obsessive and compulsive disorder in which you focus on details of things and you can't let things go out of your brain um, and social avoidance. Um, Next slide, please. Again, with anxiety, just like with depression, the cause is, is multifactorial. There can be psychological causes and also biological causes. Um, I've hit on why the biological causes um, might be similar in depression. And you can see here that the, that the chemicals are really the same. The serotonergic system, the norepinephrine and dopaminergic system are all implicated. And again, this is why you can see both depression, anxiety, thinking problems and motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease. Um, and again, the psychological factors are similar to depression in the sense that you're coping with a chronic illness and the way that this impacts your life and this may cause anxiety. Um, some of the challenges in recognizing anxiety in Parkinson's disease is that worry about your symptoms might not be anxiety. It might be factually based. It might be real. Um, you know, if you're worried about things like falling because you tend to fall, that's not anxiety, that's, that's real validated worry. Anxiety is a disorder is really about um, uh, uh, nervousness or tension when there really isn't a rational basis for it. Um, also, some of the motor symptoms might be mistaken for anxiety. If you're tremulous and you're shaking, um, someone might look at you and naively think that you must be anxious about something, but you may be very calm and not anxious at all. Uh, and it's just the motor symptoms of the disease. So it can be a challenge to discriminate these different symptoms from the motor symptoms in each other. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, I wanna talk now about impulse control. Uh, this is a problem again with these same neurotransmitter systems and brain regions. And these impulse control disorders or ICDs are difficulty in, uh, controlling impulses. We all have impulses that we want to act on, but most of us are able to hold those down and we don't act upon them. In an impulse control disorder, your ability to tamp down those impulses is reduced, and so therefore you act upon your impulses. It can come out as, as showing difficulty controlling these impulses um, as things like binge eating, hypersexuality, uh, compulsive shopping or gambling, um, and just generally acting without really thinking things through. Um, that's impulsivity. 
it's most commonly seen uh, with the use of specific drugs for Parkinson's disease. Some of the dopamine agonists can cause these problems. So this is why it's really super important for you to talk to your doctor if you have any symptoms like this and you are on these particular kinds of drugs because the doctor can move to different, potentially could move to different uh, drugs that will not give you this problem. Um, it, these can be very difficult for families to deal with. You can imagine these behaviors being very difficult for families to, to grapple with and to handle. And it can lead to significant problems with relationships um, and finances, if, particularly if you're gambling. Next slide, please. Okay, so I wanna talk now about a couple of specific symptoms here, hallucinations. Again, this is another symptom that can arise with the use of specific drugs uh, used to treat your, your Parkinson's disease. And so again, it's very important for if you're having hallucinations to tell your doctor about these because different options might be considered. Hallucinations are the perception or thinking you see, hear, or feel something that's not really there. So this is a perception that something's going on, but there isn't a physical basis for this. It's not really happening. It can be stress-related. They emerge in periods when the individual is under stress. And also some of the visual hallucinations can occur when there's low light conditions, meaning uh, when you can't see very well because of the light, um, you, you might misinterpret or misperceive and begin to hallucinate. These are often fleeting, meaning they come and go, and they tend not to be disturbing, but sometimes they can be. And of course, if they are disturbing, that's something you want to tell your doctor about because you, you don't want um, to, be, uh, to have your, your uh, person with Parkinson's disease um, upset because they're seeing things that aren't real. Again, these can often be treated um, and, and some up to a quarter or, uh, or so do uh, patients with Parkinson's disease do experience hallucinations. So it's important to inform your doctor if you're having that problem. Okay, next slide, please. I'm going to talk now about cognitive symptoms. So cognition is your ability to think and to reason and to plan to make decisions, to use language and to speak clearly and communicate your thoughts, to see and understand your visual world around you. All of these things in memory, all of these things are, are lumped in the big category of cognition. Changes in cognition are very common in people with Parkinson's disease. Um, over the course of the entire illness, most patients will experience some changes in, in cognition. And some of these are very much to be expected. I'm gonna talk about dementia a little bit later, but dementia is a different kind of severity of cognitive problems and can occur in a much uh, a lower number of individuals. So it's not, it doesn't happen to everybody, but maybe up to a quarter of patients with Parkinson's disease may become demented. Cognitive changes are generally related to a major fundamental problem called bradyphrenia. Bradyphrenia is uh, defined as a slowness of thinking just like you have slowness of movement, which is called bradykinesia. Brady meaning slow, kinesia meaning movement. So bradyphrenia is slowness of thinking. Um, so the primary cognitive issues are more about the speed with which information gets moved around in those large networks in your brain that we learned about earlier. So the overall, the fundamental problem is a slowness of thinking that mirrors the slowness of movement that you see with your motor function. The most common symptoms are memory loss, trouble coming up with information, but also coming up with words, so specific words. So this is a word finding problem, we call it tip of the tongue phenomena. I'm gonna go through the different cognitive domains now and talk about the, the difficulties you can have in each of these so that you know what to be on, on the lookout for and you can begin to talk to, with your doctor about these problems should you notice them. Okay, next slide, please. Let's talk about attention and processing speed. This is the, the set of problems that is probably the most fundamental to the other cognitive issues because the main problem is the slowing of information transfer in these brain networks. So you can imagine sort of a highway system in which if there's any sort of a slowing down of the traffic um, across these broad networks, you're gonna get an overall slowdown of everything that's happening and people just don't get the cars, don't move. Uh, they don't get to their destinations. And just like in the brain, the information doesn't make it to where it needs to go. So this is the, the concept of brain phrenia, which I talked about earlier. Um, overall, this means a slowing of the ability to, to process information and to complete tasks in a, in a timely way. 
Um, it can also be mistaken for depression. So if, you, if you're taking lots of time to get through things, people might think that you're depressed. Um, next slide, please. Uh, associated with attention and processing speed is this thing called executive function. The executive uh, abilities in your brain are the things that allow you to do complex decision making and planning. Just like an, an executive or a CEO of a company might figure out the strategy for their company and make the overall decisions, the executive centers in your brain do all of this planning and, and figuring out what's important and the goals that you're going to reach and strive for. And so if you have problems in executive function, you're going to have trouble with planning and completing multi-step tasks. It's difficult uh, to generate, maintain, and shift information around. Um, this is something we call multitasking. Uh, you may have heard of this. That, that becomes more and more difficult and problematic. There may be difficulties with problem solving. That is thinking through tasks. Should I really get on the ladder to clean the gutters out um, this fall, um, given my motor disability? And you really don't think it through, and so you get up on the ladder anyway, and, and that puts you at risk. So these difficulties with executive function uh, can be very prominent. Uh, individuals might show impaired judgment or impulse control. Um, they might have trouble initiating new tasks or behaviors, starting things, getting motivated. And that's a really common problem. That's something that's really hard to um, uh, adapt to because the, the, there's, there's just no motivation to do anything because the person feels so overwhelmed because they can't plan through what needs to be done. Again, this is related to the neurotransmitters that we've talked about earlier. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, language. Um, as, I, as I mentioned before, the most common symptom uh, with, with language happens to be word finding. This is this tip of the tongue, meaning a word is right there. You know what you want to say. It just won't come out. And then you forget about it for a while or you kept the conversation going. And then all of a sudden it pops right back into your mind and you know what it is. That phenomena happens to all of us. It happens to me. It happens to everybody at some point in their lives. But it happens more frequently in Parkinson's disease because the rapid access to that information is not working in the brain. Again, this is a primary problem of uh, processing speed. If you can't get it quickly, then it's just not going to pop out for you. We're used to having things happen on a, on a quick basis in a conversation, and words should come to us quickly. But if things aren't moving fast enough in the brain, then that's going to be slower, and every once in a while you're going to get stuck on a word. It doesn't mean that you've lost the word, meaning you've forgotten it or um, you no longer have that concept. It means that you just can't get it at that time. This is a primary retrieval problem. Going and getting information right away when you need it is just slower now. Again, this is um, more noticeable in individuals who don't have a great vocabulary. So if you don't have a very robust uh, set of things that you can substitute for, you're going to have trouble, more trouble. You're going to have, you're going to notice more trouble with coming up with words. Um, and then visual perception, which is your ability to see and understand space around you. Um, this can often lead to problems with driving and navigation. Um, oftentimes you'll see little scrapes on the side of the car where uh, the person with Parkinson's disease has bumped into another car or hit the side of the garage because they misperceive, they can't see and understand space as well. Um, of, of course, that can be uh, quite dangerous. So that's something you need to have a, a frank discussion with your care partners about if you are experiencing trouble seeing or perceiving things. Okay, I wanna move now, uh, next slide please, uh, to this issue of memory. Um, and this is the one that people worry most about because memory um, in some ways really kind of fundamentally is a chronicle or a history of who we are as people and what we've done in our lives and what we've experienced and, and who we are. So the idea of losing our memories um, is really quite frightening because it almost sort of implies a, 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 law, a little bit of a loss of personhood because you're losing pieces of you. Uh, and so it can be really, really scary. And um, I wanna just explain a little bit about the process of memory and, and how this works in Parkinson's disease. Um, it's, it's fairly common to have, have reports of, of mild memory loss uh, in Parkinson's disease. But I wanna emphasize that the problem here is quite different from the memory loss that we associate with, for example, amnesia, or Alzheimer's disease. In those two conditions, amnesia and Alzheimer's disease, the problem with memory is that you've lost information for good, meaning you had it at one point and you no longer have it. So then when you go to look for it and recall it and bring it up to your memory, um, it's not there. 
That's a different process from Parkinson's disease. In Parkinson's disease, the problem typically, um, in, 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 um, in most people with Parkinson's, the problem is, is, is encoding information and retrieving it, meaning it's hard to get information in accurately and it's hard to go and get it when you need it. Again, this is related to information processing speed. Everything's just sort of slower, and as a result, things don't get done quite as well as they should. But the contrast here between Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease is that in Parkinson's disease, most of the time, the information you're looking for is still in your memory. It's still there. It's just you're having trouble getting it or finding it. Whereas in Alzheimer's disease, it's the opposite. It's not there anymore. And so even if you could find it, you, you can't find it because it's not there anymore. So uh, this, this slide shows um, something that we call uh, uh, the process of memory. And it, it involves three steps. It's not one thing. It's three sequential things that need to happen in order for memory to work. First, you need to encode information, as you can see in the first box on the left which means you need to get information into your brain in the first place. You have to pay attention to it. You have to understand it. You have to uh, fully comprehend what's going on in order to get information in. And then you need to hold on to that information or store it. It's got to go into a place where you can make sure that it stays there. And then finally, you need to go and get that information when you want it. You have to go to the place where you've stored it and pull it out. All three of those things are processes. There, there are certain steps that together represent memory. Now I want to move to a specific, uh, next uh, slide please, um, a specific uh, aspect which is more significant cognitive changes than I've just described. Um, Parkinson's dementia, there is a dementia associated with Parkinson's disease and this is generally more severe cognitive changes than I've just described to you already. Um, the cognitive changes affect your ability to do everyday tasks. Uh, they generally use significant memory loss, uh, in, sorry, generally include significant memory loss, meaning not just occasionally missing a few things, but really having significant memory loss that worsens over time and becomes retentive in nature, meaning it does start to look like that that we see in, in perhaps amnesia or Alzheimer's disease. Um, this would characterize a Parkinson's dementia. It usually occurs late in the disease, and it may uh, affect about a half, uh, up to a half. Um, that, that's a little bit high, perhaps about a quarter to a half. Uh, but it's important to know that not all patients with Parkinson's disease develop dementia. Most of them experience the very mild cognitive changes that I described to you earlier with attention processing speed, mild retrieval-based memory loss, word-finding problems. Those are the typical mild cognitive problems that we see in Parkinson's disease. But in some individuals, these do progress as the disease progresses to develop a Parkinson's dementia, which we're, we're describing here. Okay, next slide, please. Let's, let's move to the, uh, the what can you do about this uh, section of the talk. Um, I wanna go over some brain fitness strategies. And there's a number of things we can do to keep our brains healthy as we get older. Um, and these can involve treating chronic conditions that you might have, things like diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease with medications, um, stress reduction. We talked about, uh, Davis and Connie talked about that earlier today. Uh, physical activity, which you're gonna hear about in a talk later uh, today as well. And then other lifestyle choices that you might make and how do you use your time and spend your time. Um, and then also diet. So I'm not gonna talk about those aspects. I wanna focus now on just one of these and that is mental activity. So you can keep your brain healthy by keeping your brain active. Your brain is not a muscle, but sometimes it kind of works like one in that if you train it, it, you can improve its performance and make it healthier. So let's talk a little bit about mental activity. Next slide, please. Uh, mental activity, meaning keeping your brain active, accelerates the rate at which new brain cells are created. It stimulates brain cells to be uh, made. It enhances the chance that neurons, those, those workhorses of the brain that do all of the stuff in the brain, um, survive and are healthy. It strengthens the connections, meaning the highways or roadways between different neurons. These are called synapses. And these are the connections and that's the, the, the functional area where neurons actually talk to each other, that's the synapse. And so mental activity increases the number of synapses. It, it allows neurons to reach out and start talking to their neighbors. 
in, in a very uh, important way. Um, and it's very clear, uh, all of decades of research have shown that leisure activity that involves mental stimulation decreases the risk for dementia. So this is a good way to keep your brain healthy and reduce your risk for significant cognitive problems associated with dementia. Uh, next slide, please. Let's talk about mental activity. Uh, there are three principal components for a good brain exercise. It's got to be novel. It's got to be something new. It's got to be, uh, you got to switch it up, meaning you have to have variety, do something different each time. And you've got to challenge yourself. So don't do everything that you think that you can accomplish. Push yourself a little bit and see if you can see how far your, your, your abilities uh, go. Next slide, please. Any kind of mentally challenging activity could be protective. So if you enjoy doing it, do it if it's keeping your brain active. This could be anything from crosswords, playing cards with your friends, going out and talking with your friends and socializing. Although uh, these days uh, we're encouraged to social distance, that's not as, as um, easy to do, but things like Zoom and video conferencing and telephone, all of these things can stimulate neurons because you're engaging your brain to experience new things and other people bring new ideas to you. So all of these things on the slide here that you see could be protective, if you enjoy doing them, do them. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I try to encourage my patients to learn something new every day. It could be a new concept, a new word, uh, a new exercise, a physical exercise. Engage with people. Next slide, please. Um, it's easier to remember things that you've practiced. So the more that you work at this, the better your memory is going to be. Um, the more a memory is activated, the stronger it becomes. Those neurons become stronger when you activate them. So it's important to reduce distractions when you're trying to learn things. So this is the idea of encoding. Poor input of memories means that it's gonna be making retrieval harder to do. So try and focus your attention when you want to remember something. Next slide, please. Um, I encourage people to do this three step when, you're tr when you know you have something to remember. Um, three steps, attend, visualize, and connect. Um, if you pay attention, create a mental image, and then connect the mental images together. For example, if you park in spot 3B in the parking lot, you might imagine visually um, three angry bees buzzing over your car, and that might trigger a visual stimulus or image that allows you to remember that and make that image uh, stronger. And you'll remember that you're parked in spot 3B uh, when you come back to find your car. Next slide, please. Uh, remembering names. Um, you've really got to commit yourself to learning the name. Um, and this is part of paying attention and really focusing. You have to make that visual connection between what you're hearing when you hear the person's name and that person's uh, physical image, their face, their body language, whatever, so that you can make the connection. That's what learning is, connecting two pieces of information. You can uh, help achieve this by repeating the name during the conversation, uh, repeating the person's name, say the person's name when you say goodbye, uh, Joan, it was really nice to meet you. Uh, that will help you reinforce those, these associations. Next slide, please. Now for care partners, I have a couple of recommendations and I'm gonna step through this quick because my time is, is just coming up. Um, written notes and lists are helpful. Um, if, a if a person with Parkinson's disease can both hear and see the information you want them to retain, it's gonna be easier. Again, connecting visual and verbal. But these are only good if you, if, you, if you orient the patient to the note. You gotta tell them that it's there and where it is. And you gotta put them in a prominent place in the home. That is, um, put them someplace where, where the, the person is going to see them. Uh, use specific prompts and cues. Um, general things like what happened today is not really gonna trigger a memory, but did anybody call today? Did Linda call today? Those sorts of things are going to help. Uh, keep things in routine places. And um, I don't encourage people to step in when someone is having a word finding moment um, and you know what they're trying to say. It's probably not the best idea to immediately jump in and, and complete the sentence for them. Um, let, them let them work it out. It's the, the, the information is probably there. They're just having a little bit of trouble getting at it. And it's that, that's the retrieval problem that I told you about. It can be um, uh, reinforcing for an individual to actually find the word and come up with it. But obviously, if they're struggling for you know, a minute at a time or two minutes, you don't want to do that. But can I finish the sentence for you? Okay, I think what you're trying to say is um, that might be one way to go about it. Take home points. Uh, next slide, please. If you have symptoms that I've described today, 
ask your doctor to evaluate them and, uh, because some of these things might be addressable, particularly because we know now that these things can impact your quality of life. Um, care partner stress is related to the severity of these symptoms. So it's important to recognize that stress care partners might feel uh, might be uh, alleviated if these non-motor symptoms are, are addressed. Um, processing speed is the major problem here. So given time, um, that's an important thing. Keep your brain active with novelty and challenge. Uh, focus on learning something new every day. Next slide, please. And I thank you for your attention.